Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want, to, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the commands given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understanding slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Okay, well, if you keep that passage open in front of you, that'll be helpful. Um, as I mentioned at the start, uh, during this week I was in Sydney for a conference. Um, and as I was flying back from that, that conference, I was on the leg from Brisbane through to Mackay. I was sitting next to this uh, fellow who he lives in Mackay, who is a bricklayer. Uh, we, we were talking for a lot of the trip, and we, we got onto spiritual topics. And I asked him a few questions. I asked him uh, what he believed about God, whether he believed that God existed. And I also asked him the question of what he thought um, about where the world is actually headed where he thought the world was headed. And so he talked about that for a little bit and then he put the question back to me and said, well, what do you think about where the world is headed? And I said to him, well, I believe that Jesus is coming back, that he's going to return, he's going to wrap this whole thing up, there will be an end to this present world. And I wonder what your response is as you are reminded or maybe hear for the first time that Jesus is coming back. I read a joke a couple of weeks ago, the papal secretary says to the Pope, uh, Jesus has returned. Uh, he's just ridden on a donkey into St. Peter's Square. He's wowing people. Uh, and the Pope responds and says, quick everyone, look busy. And I kind of wonder whether that sort of response, that sort of anxiety uh, is kind of the common response to mention of Jesus' return. Maybe that's how you feel. And yet I think the thing is, as, as we have that initial anxiety for thoughts of his return, it's very easy to kind of drift back into a blasé type of attitude about that fact that that is what is coming for us. I mean, even for the Christians who can be convinced that that is the reality that is coming for them, it's very easy the thoughts of the second coming to just drift to the back of the mind. I mean, we live our busy lives thinking about the second coming can seem almost like a distraction to the things that we're trying to get done in the here and now. And on one level, it is very removed, isn't it, from our present day experience. It's almost surreal to think that Jesus will come and bring an end to this present world. Is that really going to happen? 
I mean, why do we need to be reminded about Jesus' second coming? Why does it matter? Can we be really sure that that is what is coming? Well, let's pray uh, as we come to look at 2 Peter 3 together. Afternoon. Father, we uh, come before you now, Lord, and we, we do just pray that you would uh, settle our hearts. Uh, Father, give us ears to hear. Uh, Father, we thank you that you have spoken. Uh, thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we do just pray that you would be at work, helping us to, to have eyes to see these realities of which your words speak of. Help us to see them with great clarity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we've been working through the book of 2 Peter, we've seen uh, that it's this letter, it's written by the Apostle Peter. Uh, he writes to Christians in the first century who were scattered uh, in the geographical region of modern-day Turkey. And actually, as you get to the start of chapter 3 of 2 Peter, uh, Peter actually lets us know the purpose, the, the reason that he actually wrote this letter down for us, this second letter uh, that is part of the New Testament from Peter's hand. Uh, have a look at the very start of chapter 3. First one. He says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. See, Peter says to us that he has written both this letter, 2 Peter as well as 1 Peter as well, he has written both of them with the express purpose, not, not to give us new information necessarily, but to remind us. Uh, and you see there that he wants it to remind us and bring us to, to wholesome thinking, uh, sincere thinking, sober-minded kind of thinking. And if you've been here as we've been working through 2 Peter, you might uh, realise that this is actually a, a great emphasis for Peter. He is very concerned about our thoughts and the things we think of. As we are driven along by our desires, as we go through various experiences in this world, what is most crucial for us is that we think clearly and understand those experiences from God's perspective. What do we need to be reminded of? We'll have a look at verse 2. He says there that we need to recall, firstly, the, the words of the Old Testament, that is the words of the prophets, the first part of the Bible. And then he talks about the command of Jesus Christ, which is written down for us in the words of the apostles. Essentially, he's referring to the New Testament. And this is something we've seen as we've worked with 2 Peter as well. There's this great stress. Uh, the foundation of everything that Peter says is the Scriptures, is the Bible. And a bit of a side point, you could ask the question, well, what is this command that has been given by our Lord Jesus, uh, Lord and Saviour? What, what exactly is Peter speaking about there? Uh, and I think most likely he's talking about uh, the kind of ethical qualities that he's called us to pursue. Now, if you remember back to chapter 1, verse 5, uh, those words that Peter said that we're to make every effort uh, to add to our faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and so on towards love. It may be that Peter actually has in mind Jesus somewhere of the Lord. Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. I mean, even... The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13 verse 8 says that love is the fulfilment of the law. But as you kind of look at this section here and as you hear what Peter's saying, I mean, what has all that got to do with the second coming of Christ? Peter writes to remind us. Uh, he wants us to recall the scriptures, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible. He wants us to heed his command, this call to life for love. What's that got to do with the second coming? We'll have a look at verse 3. He says there, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of the creation. Peter says that there will be scoffers in the last days. And do you notice in what Peter says, I mean, he says that these scoffers will question where is this coming that Jesus promised. Uh, Peter tells us in verse 3 that they'll be driven by their evil desires. Uh, if you've been reading through 2 Peter with us, you'll remember that this is a, a, again another thing with Peter. He keeps talking about corrupt desires, evil desires, those disordered desires. That's what's driving them. But the false, uh, sorry, the scoffer here is actually right about one thing, that there has been a delay. 
And as it says there, everything since the ancestors died, everything keeps going on as it has since the creation of the world. They're right. The world is still going on. There has been a delay in Christ's return. And in fact, this language of uh, the ancestors there in verse 4, it's actually literally talking about the fathers. Uh, Most scholars think that what Peter is talking about here is the first generation of Christians. You see, as he writes this letter, most likely around AD 64, that that first generation of Christians, they started to die. And so for their children and for the next generation, they're beginning to question, where is this coming that Jesus spoke about? And yet what we see here is that uh, though the false teacher is right about the delay, they're very wrong in the conclusion that they draw here, that this means that Christ will not come. And Peter goes on to unpack that. They they should have known the certainty of the word that God speaks. uh, And what is it that they're forgetting? Uh, What do they deliberately forget? Well, not just the power of God's word as it speaks of the future. They they actually forget the power of God's word as it's been shown in the past and God's actions. Verse 5 to 7. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed and by the same word the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. You see, Peter says, as the prophets have told us, the Old Testament has told us, in fact, he's referring specifically to the book of Genesis in what he talks about here and the words of Moses. The prophets have told us that the very world, the creation in which we live, it came into existence by God's word. He spoke and it happened. Peter's so saying that the whole reason that this world exists is because of God's powerful voice. And it's interesting um, we're actually going to be thinking some more into this idea of God's word which brings about the creation over the next three weeks. Uh, we have Jonathan who's going to be preaching for us, our, our kids church uh, leader, one of our members here. Jonathan, he's going to be spending three weeks actually looking at Genesis 1 uh, and this idea of God's creation, this powerful creation by word. Uh, but we'll talk a bit more about that. But as Jonathan will cover... I mean, it doesn't really matter whether you accept the scientific consensus of the the day with evolution and the like, or whether you uh, reject that and you don't accept that. But the thing that Peter is saying is you can't ignore that this world has come from somewhere. And Peter tells us from the scripture, it comes because God spoke and it happened. But as you think about this word for the future, the word of Christ's return, the word about the judgment to come. And as that feels like it's something so surreal and so removed from our experience, Peter wants us to recall one other event that's recorded for us in the Old Testament. He refers here in verse 6 to the worldwide flood, Genesis 6 to 9, where God actually did bring judgment and destruction on the whole world. And it's interesting, I don't know if you've ever looked into it before, but actually all of the ancient cultures in some way, shape or form in their myths and stories, they all make reference to a great flood or a, or a worldwide flood. It's interesting, isn't it? Different people interpret those facts in different ways, but we've got to make something, don't we? Here in the Bible, Genesis 6 to 9, we have a historical record of this worldwide flood and each of the ancient cultures in their own way refer to that event happening. I mean, we should have great confidence that that is the history. That is what God has done in the past. And so if that be the case, if we shouldn't ignore what Peter is saying about Jesus' return, what do we make of this delay that the scoffer has observed? You see what Peter says in verse 8 and 9. He says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And what Peter is saying here is that time is actually different for God. 
God literally has all the time in the world. For him, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. I mean, that's fascinating to think about for us in the West, many of whom uh, aren't so much limited for money, but we are limited for time. And what does Peter say that God, with all this time on his hands, uh, what does Peter say that God does? Well, in the period of delay, Peter says what we ought to see as we reflect and contemplate that delay, we should see God's patience. We should see in that a God who, as he says there in verse 9, do you see what he says there? He says he doesn't want anyone to perish but he wants all to come to repentance. He wants everyone to turn back to him and his goodness. You were here last week, we were talking about the reality of hell that awaits for all those who have not received Christ and his death on their behalf. Eternal conscious torment is what we talked about. It's a terrible reality. And you can kind of get to wondering as you hear about that, I mean, what kind of God would send people to hell Well, here Peter tells us it is a God who is patient. It is a God who desires that no one perish. That is his heart there. Now now is the time to repent and to receive Christ's benefit. Notice what Peter says in verse 15. It's skipping ahead a little bit, but verse 15. He says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience, it means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave you. God's patience in this age, the delay, means salvation. When you think about it, I mean, this is amazing. This, This is the God who actually bore with humanity for thousands of years, right through the times of Adam. Uh, right through Abraham. He put up with Israel and their repeated rebellion and held off his full judgment in patience for many, many years, thousands of years, until just the right time when he sent his son to hang up on a cross and experience that judgment in our place. And then, so that we might have the chance to receive the benefits of Christ's death for us, God waits still. Now is the time of amnesty when we can actually turn back to Christ. But notice that God hasn't just waited two years or ten years. No, he has again waited thousands and thousands of years. Such is his patience. And what we see in all this is that the reason that we must be reminded about Christ's return is so that we can see that there has been a delay so that we might think and reflect why that delay has been and so that we will see God's patience, so that we might see his heart that no one would perish. In my first year of university, uh, we were told clearly at the start of the first semester, first year, that there would be exams coming. The reason we were told that was because there was a delay until those exams came. And the reason that we were told that there would be exams uh, was so that in that period of delay, we would actually use it for the purpose for which it was set. So that we'd study, so that we would listen to our lectures, so that we'd prepare for those exams that were coming. Well, Peter is saying to us, we must know that Jesus Christ will return so that we realise that now is a period of delay and so that we will see God's patience and we will see that his patience or to lead us to repentance and to taking hold of the salvation that Christ has won. And can I say to you this afternoon, if if you're not living your life as if Christ is coming back, if that's not the thing that's in the forefront of your mind, can I urge you to see the great error in that? I mean, there's so much goodness in God. There's so much kindness. Here's the God who, at the very at his centre or heartbeat is this desire that no one can. I mean, can you kind of see the, the great offence that it is if we take that delay to mean that he's not actually coming back at all rather than repenting? 
Now, the delay is not a reason to write off Christ's return. It's a reason to take it ever more seriously, to use this aid for the purpose for which it was appointed. And can I say to you, if you're a Christian person here this afternoon, but if you're, if you're someone who is being tempted by the scoffer, tempted to think that maybe Christ's return is not going to happen after all, well, see clearly what Peter says here. We can be sure that it is coming because God's word is powerful. By his word, he created this world. By his word, he has brought judgment once. And by his word, he will bring Christ's return again. We need to see the delight. And we need to realize God's patience and his heart for us not to perish. So that we don't miss it. Because as we think about the reason that we must be reminded of Christ's repentance, it's not just about knowing what this delay is for. We also need to know about Christ's return because of what is coming on that day. And we've actually already read one of the verses that Peter unpacks this in, verse 7, but it's worth reading again. Uh, he says in verse 7, By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter says here that with the return of Christ comes fire. With the return of Christ comes judgment. With the return of Christ comes destruction for all who haven't received Christ or repented and turned back to Jesus. In fact, Peter puts this even more bluntly and sharply in verse 10. It says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. See what he's saying there? I mean, this day of the Lord, it will come suddenly. We don't know when this day will come. And he goes on to say that what will happen on this day is that fire that he's already spoken of. But notice what he says there, that the heavens and earth will disappear, the elements will melt. Can you imagine that day when all your possessions will suddenly disappear? Your house, your car, the food that you have in your cupboard and your fridge, your technology, your money in the bank, even the whole social construct in which you may be finding your value, it will all burn and disappear. But notice here, that there is one thing that will not be gone. Peter says in verse 10 there that when everything else is burnt up, the earth and everything done in it, end of verse 10, will be laid bare. Literally, he says there that the earth and the works done in it will be found. They'll be exposed. And what Peter is saying here is that when Jesus Christ returns, all the material things, which we spend so much of our time living for and pursuing, they'll be gone. And what will be left is our actions, our deeds that have been done in seeking those material things. What will be left, to put it in Peter's framework, will be our love, the self-control that we've exercised, our perseverance. What will be left will be our trust in the word of God or not. What will be left will be the evidence of whether we have received Christ and his judgment on our behalf. That's what will remain. And the thing is, for the, for the Christian person, for the person who has received Jesus Christ and his death on our behalf, I mean, on that day, the Christian person has nothing to fear. On that day, uh, they will go to be with Christ. I mean, see verse 13, how Peter explains it. But in keeping with his promise, God's promise, we, the Christian, are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You see, Peter is saying that, that for the Christian, uh, the one who has received Jesus and his forgiveness, who has taken God at his word when God has said that there is a way of escaping Christ, for that person, what awaits them is the new heavens, the new earth, the home of righteousness. They'll go to be with God himself. 
they'll be caught up with his life. They'll be made like him. And yet, of course, for the ungodly, that day will mean fire. That day will mean destruction. And so that's why we need to be reminded of the day of Christ, is because of what's coming on that day. Presently, I'm part of the uh, PNC committee that uh, operates in this school community, the Parents and Citizens Association. And, and part of being on that committee is that from time to time, I'll get asked along to different uh, ceremonies and things that are happening, uh, awards, presentations, or uh, investiture ceremonies of leaders. And generally, I'd, I'd been to a bunch of them. They were fairly low-key, casual kind of occasions. And so when I got invited to the next one, I was not too concerned. Uh, got the date and the time to make sure I'd be there. Wasn't too worried. And I think I was told that the local member, the state member for which Sunday would be present at this gathering, but I, I didn't really know what that meant. I kind of just ignored that bit of information. Big mistake. Uh, I rocked up on this particular, I think it was a, a leadership investiture ceremony, dressed just like I am now. Uh, the member for Whit Sunday had suit and tie, and everyone else up the front was dressed in suitable attire. Uh, I knew that I'd have to be presenting awards, but my award was the first one to present. And as I got up to present, I got told on the spot, uh, can you say a few words on behalf of the PNC? Uh, and so I kind of got up and stumbled through a few words. But as subsequent speakers stood up and addressed the assembly, uh, I realised that I'd missed a crucial bit. You were meant to do the formal address at the start. Good morning, uh, special guest, member for Whit Sunday, and so on. I'd missed that part. And even at the end of that ceremony, uh, making small talk, chit chat. So, Jason, what, what have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Well, Mr. Wright, what I've been doing is this, that, and the other. I just, I, I totally didn't understand what it meant that there would be a minister uh, part of that assembly. Well, in the same way, when it comes to the day of Christ, we have to understand what it means that Christ will return. That is the day that will bring judgment and salvation. That is the day where everything, all the material things, will be burned up and gone, and what will be left is our actions and the things that we have done. And if we are aware of what is coming on that day, if we can see that, then we will realise that what really matters are our deeds done, not the material. And it's a great concern to me, uh, both in my own life and as I observe other people's lives, it is a great concern that so much of the decisions that we make, that they're built around the material things. We make our choices. Uh, the big life decisions, they're based on things like money and houses and material things. And what Peter is saying here is that if that's what we live our lives, if we live our lives for money, if we live our lives as we've seen in 2 Peter for that, that want for more, if that's the thing that is driving us, if we live our lives for pleasure and for sex, Peter is saying that we will be in great trouble when that day comes, when Jesus Christ returns. And I think this is it's so important because it's so easy to get caught up in the things of now. The events and the, and the plans and the outcomes of the things that we're doing, it's so easy to focus on what's happening in the here and now. And if we are not clear about what Christ's return means, then we will miss the fact that what really matters is our character, is our love. And I think with all of this, I mean, we've seen why we must be aware of Christ's return. Because, so we understand what this delay is all about. There's a free gift waiting for us in Christ, and, and He wants us to receive that. We need to know what's coming on that day because of what will happen on that day. But we also need to know what is coming because it must, as I hope you can see, it must shape our lives now. See what Peter says as we going to cover our last point. See what Peter says about the way we should act in light of Christ's return, verse 11. He says, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? He tells us. You ought to live holy 
and godly life as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with you. Verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Peter there says a few different things, there's a few different elements, but in the end they, they, they fit together as part of the same thing. I mean, how should we live in light of Christ's return? Well, he tells us, verse 11, you, you ought to live holy and godly lives. Verse 14, you ought to make every effort to be found spotless and blameless. I mean, this is the, the character stuff that Peter has so stressed through this letter. Chapter 1, verse 5, make every effort to add to faith, goodness, and to goodness, uh, knowledge and to knowledge, self-control and so forth. Make every effort to add to love. And yet I think more than the bare character attributes, what, what Peter is speaking to us, to us about here uh, is, is this whole call to life that we've considered uh, from the, be the beginning of 2 Peter in chapter 1. If you were here when we looked at that chapter, you'll remember that the big picture is that this call to life, the thing that we are being called to chapter 1 verse 4 is to actually participate in the divine nature that is the call to be rightly related to God to begin being made like God and you see Peter closes with that same idea that the way that that will happen is as we are found at peace with him verse 14 it will be verse 18 as we grow in grace and knowledge of this God we saw in chapter 1, verse 3, that the power for change is actually being brought back to God, being brought back to Him to see His love, to see His patience, to see His power. And as we relate to Him, that cannot but shape and transform us. And notice here that Peter is not saying that Christianity is all about good works. He is not saying that we need to know of the return of Christ so that we live good enough lives so that we will be okay when Jesus returns. That is, that is not what he is saying. No, he is saying that Christianity is all about knowing God. It's all about being restored in relationship to that God. It's all about the fact that Jesus has died to bring us back to peace with God. I mean, we've all lived at least parts of our lives living for our desire for more. We are all in great trouble apart from Christ. But our great hope is that Jesus has died for us, that there is actually a way forward that we can receive from him this free gift of knowing our God again. That's the message of Christianity. And if we properly understand that Christ is coming back, if we properly understand why there is this delay now, if we properly understand what is coming on that day, then we will naturally want to live lives where we are like our God, the God that we have come to know in Christ. We won't be able to wait on one thing for Jesus to return. I mean, do you notice a couple of times there, verse 12, verse 14, Peter uses that language that the Christian is, is looking forward to this day because the Christian wants to be done with this world, which is corrupted through evil desires. The Christian eagerly desires this home of righteousness. They want to be with their God, fully and finally. I mean, this life, this life is an arena in which we prepare for that life to come. This life is a time to seek that God and seek to be shaped and made like Him, by His power. I mean, all the struggles and ups and downs of life, they're, they're meant to be an opportunity for us to be shaped by God and made like Him, we need to be reminded about Christ's return. We began this afternoon with that question, why do we need to be reminded? Why does it matter that Christ is coming back? Can we really be sure that that's going to happen? It seems clearly that we, we must be reminded because of this period of delay, so that we see what this time is about. We can be sure that Jesus is coming back because we have the Old Testament which records for us the things that God has done in history. 
We need to be reminded because of what will come. Judgment and salvation. The new heavens and the new earth. Or judgment and destruction and hell. We need to be reminded. Because it will shape our life now. If we know that Christ is returning. I said at the start. On one hand, the second coming can kind of seem like a distraction uh, to the things that we're doing in the here and now. But actually, it's the other way around, isn't it? All the things that we get caught up with now, they're actually a distraction from what is coming in this world to come. That's where our eyes need to be fixed. The time now is to heed this calling of God, the calling to life. The, the calling to escape the corruption of this world. Now is the time to have our eyes open and to actually see what is going on around us. To open our hearts to God, to receive what He wants to give to us, so we might open our mouths and speak of His grace and glory to everyone that we come across. If you go to work this week, as you get back into regular life after the service this afternoon and conversations over afternoon tea, whatever you do, seek to know God in Christ. Whatever you do, live your life for this God. Jesus has brought you back for Him. Live your life for Him. And as God gives you opportunity, make known this God. 